Johnny, go on, Mrs. Uh, I've no time yet. <laughs> To my father, Sam Kidd, who was born in 1915 and died in 1982, far too young at the age of 68, was in approximately 240 films. Thank you. <laughs> Give or take a few. Michael Parkinson said of him, he made more films than the MGM lion. According to his unpublished autobiography, which I have fortuitously just discovered in a trunk in my mother's loft, 104 of these films he made between 1945 and 1952. So in just seven years, 104 films. What a film business we had at that time. And he at last managed to convince his mother, who wanted him to get a proper job with a pension, that possibly being an actor might just work for him. There's something I want you to do for me. Anything to help the cause? What is it? You know all sorts of people, don't you? I suppose I do. Why? I want someone to do a job for me. A rather special little job. You couldn't give me a few more details, could you? So I can get a better idea of the sort of man we'll need. You've got to be trusted. Oh, that complicates things. There's not many people I know as I'd trust. Please, Daisy. This is important. I'm sorry, sir. I'll put it all in one sentence. Do you know a man who'll kill someone for me? Kill someone? Who? Kemp? No, not Kemp. Who then? No one important. No one important? I don't get you. Do you know someone who'll do it? Look, Charles, I've been right with you all the way, but this is different. It's a sticky business, murder. But this isn't murder. Isn't murder? But look, you just asked me if I knew of anyone who... You would... probably think I'm talking to the back of my neck. But you'll find out sooner or later. The whole point is, can you help me? I can find a chap for you, but... Don't bother your head about the finer points. Leave that to me. All I want you to do is to get a man for me who will kill someone. It'll cost quite a bit, you know. How much? Five hundred. Fair enough. But bear in mind these points. He must be reliable. He must not know who I am or anything about me. And above all, he's got to be able to keep his mouth shut. You realize if you won't tell me what it's all about, that you'll have to see this chap yourself. Oh, yes, of course. When do you want to see him? As soon as possible. So, how did he get into the business of show? He'd come over with his mother. He'd, he'd come over with his mother and her brothers from Belfast and set up home eventually in Chiswick. And then he was sent to school in Luton to Dunstable Grammar, where Gary Cooper had been a pupil, obviously not at the same time. I have no idea how my dad ended up there. He never told me. It must have been some family contact somewhere. The timing of his arrival from Ireland also appears to vary. In his book, he says he came to London when he was seven. But I distinctly remember him telling me he was 13. And also, I remember a picture of him, which I can't find, wearing an orange sash, banging a drum, where he's quite a well-developed youngster, and I don't recall there being any orange marches in Bedfordshire. So, on leaving school at 16 in 1931, he lived in Bayswater, then Shepherd's Bush, and he worked at Whiteley's in the bedding department and at Alvis Carr's. He'd learnt to tap dance in the kitchen of an ex-tiller girl who taught him at two shillings and sixpence a lesson. Then he brushed up his skills at the Budley Bradley School of Dance in Soho and was part of a cabaret tap dance duo singing and tapping to standards like Nasty Man and Let's Fall in Love. He also tapped and did stand-up at various talent contests for which there was a one-pound prize. Mind you, you could spend a night at the Ritz for a quid in those days and still have change for a ham sandwich. <laughs> Uh, my father was uh, at work for Oscar Rabin before the war, as well as doing lots of talent shows. He told me that the bit, that normally there were nine people in the talent show, uh, nine acts, turns in the talent show. And um, if you were about six, then you're any good, you'd normally win it. He said, and you'd, uh, you'd win about five pounds, which of course then was, uh, was, was the 30s, was very good money. And he was working uh, for the Oscar Rabin band in South End, in fact, um, as an MC. So you're the new owner of Four Winds, eh? Are you happy there? Well, oh, it's all right. It's a bit quiet, but that's what I want for my work. Oh, of course. You're a writer, aren't you? For my sins. Well, you'll have to excuse my ignorance, because I don't get around to much reading, except about property. That's my line. What do you write? Novels? Well, I'm trying to get down to a novel at the moment, but uh, I have to keep stopping to review other people's books. 
Anyway, I'm a lousy typist. Oh, that sounds like a job for Mrs. Stockley. Oh, who's she? Valerie Stockley. She calls herself Mrs. Only nobody's ever seen the mister. She's either separated or divorced. She's a first-class typist. She only works when she's hard up. She works for me occasionally. She's quite a dish, is Mrs. Stockley. Quite a dish. Sounds like a story. Well, there's a story there, all right, but I don't figure in it. I'm not her type, worse luck. For a brief period, my father called himself John Kidd, his father's name, but noticed there was another actor called John Kidd, who spelt his name K-I-double-D and not K-Y-double-D. And my father received a tax demand that was clearly meant for the other John and not him, as well as some extravagant bills for women's underwear. So he reverted to Sam. Uh, the curse of the different spelling repeated itself when I first started acting, and my voiceover agent phoned me in the middle of a voiceover session demanding to know if all was all right, as apparently I'd had a stroke. When in actual fact, it was the same John Kidd with an I and not Jonathan Kidd with a Y who'd had the stroke. Someone had tried to book me and had phoned the wrong agent. 